Good morning. My name's Marty West, and I'm an associate professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and the editor of Education Next. And it's a pleasure today to welcome you to a discussion of the findings of the 2017 Education Next poll on school reform. This is the 11th year in which we have been surveying a nationally representative sample of Americans about their attitudes on a wide range of education policies. And as someone who's been involved with this effort since the beginning, I can't remember another year when I was as eager as this one to get my hands on the data when it came in to see what we had found. There's no denying, as we say in the essay sharing the results of the poll, that the political climate in the United States has been changing. And so this year's survey provided us the first opportunity to take a look at attitudes of the public about education reform in the age of Donald Trump. So that's what we'll be doing this morning. We'll look at what has changed and what hasn't, what we might expect going forward. And in order to do so, we're first going to hear from my colleague at Education Next, Paul Peterson, who will take 20 minutes to share some highlights from the survey. Paul is the Henry Lee Shattuck Professor of Government at Harvard University, where he also directs the Program on Education Policy and Governance. He's a senior fellow at the Hoover Institution, who has graciously allowed us to use their beautiful facilities here this morning, and he's also the senior editor at Education Next. After Paul's remarks, we will uh, invite a illustrious panel to the stage that will be moderated by Allison Klein, who reports on federal education policy for Education Week and co-authors their popular, uh, popular and influential blog, The Politics K-12. Uh, we just found in a recent article in Education Next that looked at influence on social media that her Twitter account was number 10 in terms of its influence on social media in the United States, just ahead of the president of the National Educational Association. I found that she asks, uh, for my money, the best questions about education policy of any reporter around. So we're happy to invite her to uh, have uh, play that role for us today. Welcome also to those of you who are watching the live stream online. Uh, if you're here or out there and would like to tweet about today's event, you can use the hashtag ENPoll and the participant bios that you have in front of you, either on a handout or online, also include all of the handles for the participants. Without further ado, let me invite Paul Peterson to the stage to walk us through the findings. This is the 11th survey. This year we did the survey in May and June. We had 4,200 respondents. We work with Knowledge Networks, an online company that uh, surveys people on the internet. It's a nationally representative sample. They make special efforts to ensure that. Because we use this online survey, we're able to get over samples of specialized populations, such as teachers. So there's very few, if any, survey out there that simultaneously interviews the public and interviews teachers on the same item. And we have an oversample of Hispanic respondents and an oversample of parents. Um, the authors of the essay that accompanies the survey and the people who were involved in designing the survey are Martin West, who you know, who was the senior author, and then Michael Henderson, who's our survey director, and Samuel Barrows, who is a postdoc at the Program on Education Policy Governance at Harvard University, and myself. OK, so the question that has attracted the most attention in the news media when we release the results is the one about charter schools. Basically, here's the question. I won't read it. But basically, it's a question asking them if they support or oppose the formation of charter schools. And we see a sharp decline this year in that, uh, res in, that uh, in the percentage of the population who say, yes, they support formation of charter schools. The yellow line is the general public. The red line are, is, are Democrats. The blue, no, Republicans, the blue line uh, are Democrats. The dotted lines is the 
percent opposed. What you don't see is the percent that take a neutral position. One of the things that we do that other surveys don't do is we don't allow a don't know response. Instead, we allow people to say they neither support nor oppose. And so we'll get around 20% of the population to many questions who say they neither support nor oppose. So when you see a 60% majority, as we saw four charters back in 2013, that's an overwhelming majority with only 20% uh, opposed. That's, that's for Republicans. For the public as a whole back then, we saw 50% 50, 50%. Now just this year, we get a drop of 13 percentage points in the public as a whole and a drop for Republicans and Democrats alike. There's no significant difference in the drop across groups. We've looked at Hispanics, African Americans, uh, different categories of whites, Republicans. This is a uniform drop. So this, I think, is one of the most important findings in the survey. We also asked a series of questions about private school choice. We have a tax credit question. Here it is on the screen. We have a question about uh, vouchers. We have several questions about vouchers. I won't go into all those permutations. It could take me up my whole 20 minutes that I've been allotted for that <laughs> purpose alone. And education savings accounts. Now, of all these, the most popular private school choice concept is the tax credit concept. The green shows support, the red shows opposition, and you can see that green bar is much longer than the red bar for tax credits. And for education savings accounts at the bottom, you get the opposite. That's not an idea that's caught on at this point in time, though it's one that some of the voucher proponents are pushing hard in certain states. So the fact that Illinois just adopted a tax credit scholarship program is Probably not surprising given the relatively high level of support for this as distinct from various voucher programs. Uh, for all um, of the private school choice programs, we tended to see a change in the balance of support and opposition. It was mainly a decline in the opposition. We see some uptick in support for tax credits, and we see a substantial decline in opposition to tax credits. And the same is true for variations on the voucher plan. And it's not only our poll. In the PDK poll that was just released a week or two ago, <clears throat> they included a question, do you favor or oppose allowing students and parents to choose a private school to attend at public expense? It's not a very favorable way to ask that question. But it does, uh, it, it's more important to have exactly the same question from year to year than the exact phrasing that you have. And you can see here once again that the level of opposition, which is much higher in their poll than we get in our polls, but it's, it's gone sub down substantially from 70% to 52%, whereas the support level has increased from 29 to 39%. So their poll is quite consistently showing rising levels of support, and especially among Democrats. Uh, who, who would have thought that? Uh, uh, and, and so we don't, the Republicans, there's been no change. That's that 46% uh, figure up there. But Democrats have become more supportive. Now, if you go on to homeschooling, uh, you will see that the public uh, do, does think that parents should be allowed to homeschool. The green bar is longer than the red bar. Not you know, it's only 46 to 34, but it's still a, um, a significant difference. And, but they do think that uh, school districts uh, should be notified, and the majority does think that the district should approve it. So there's qualifications on the public support for homeschooling, which continues to be a significant share of the school age population. That's uh, not an insignificant sector. OK, if we move on to Common Core, uh, we see that the bottom uh, for, of support uh, has stabilized for Common Core. A couple years ago, we saw a big decline. You can see that in the green bar here. Big decline between 2013 and 2016, but no further decline that's significant in the last year, despite the talk about Common Core in the course of the last uh, year in political campaigns, <clears throat> that didn't change public opinion. And you see um, that uh, the opposition um, 
that did rise rapidly between 2013 and 2016 has slipped a little bit this past year. Now, if you drop the word common core, then you get a completely different result. In, if you drop the word common core, you get the results that are reported in the dotted line up there. So the support level for standards, same standards across the states, I'll just go back to the question so you can see it again. In the states that have these standards, see, we don't call them common core standards. For half of the sample, randomly chosen, we don't use the word common core. The other half uses common core. So we actually have two surveys going on simultaneously here. Half of them get the word common core and half of them don't. And so for those who don't get it, we see an uptick in support for same standards across the states and a decline in opposition. So it's even stronger evidence that the public is acceptance of this idea. And it's the politicization of the concept of the common core. It's a brand name that doesn't work anymore. It's why states are no longer using the word common core when they do set up standards that are similar to those of, their, uh, of the other states. OK, so on federalism, we're finding a move towards local control. We asked three questions about that, whether or not the, what level of government should play the biggest role in fixing failing schools, deciding whether one's failing, setting educational standards, which students should know. And basically, people think the state should do that. That's the blue column there, the blue part of the column. And th that doesn't really change much. That, that's about the same size. What's changing is the green at the top and the red at the bottom. The red at the bottom is the local, no, uh, yes, is, is, is the local uh, share. And you can see between 2015 and 2017, that generally increases. So each question is being presented separately there. And you can see the 2017 number bumps up in each case. And the green bar recedes for each question. It's not big changes, but we see some little shift towards a preference for local control in American education. Now, evaluating teachers, we ask them, suppose you had to evaluate each teacher in your local school for the quality of their work. What percent of the teachers in your local schools would you put in each category? Your, num your answer should total to 100%. Well, by and large, people like their teachers. You'll get 2 thirds of the population saying, or 2 thirds of parents saying, that the parents at their local school are, that, uh, about two thirds of the parents at their local school are excellent or good. So we, this is the, for the average respondent, the average parent, they'll come in with a report that two thirds of the parents are either excellent or good. And only 14% say they are unsatisfactory. But still, 14% of the teachers are identified as unsatisfactory by parents. And even more interesting, 11% of the teachers say that about their colleagues. So I would say there's two good news and bad news here. One is people think the teachers are pretty good. But people think there is a small minority, but a significant minority. Now, when you look at evaluation schemes that are out there, they usually identify about 1% or 2% or 3% of the teachers as unsatisfactory. So there seems to be a disjunction between what teachers observe themselves and what evaluation systems pick up. OK, other personnel questions that we asked were, had to do with tenure and with uh, union fees and with merit pay. So our results here are generally, for two of these items, big differences between what the public thinks and what parents think. And the parents and the public think pretty much the same way. We only put up one of them at a time here to simplify things. But when you look at what the public say, it's very close to what parents will tell you as well. And the public actually uh, does like merit pay. You see that green bar is bigger than the uh, red bar at the very top there. That's a, a little closer between those two bars than it was uh, a year ago. So actually, public support for merit pay has slipped a little bit. It's not a lot, but it's three, four, per, five percentage points. I've forgotten exactly, but it's something in that range. But there's still a lot more support for merit pay on the part of the public than teachers who are overwhelmingly opposed. 78% of them are opposed. And that hasn't changed. That's what we, we get every year. So then when you go to teacher tenure, we get the sort, more or less the same pattern, although uh, the public is here is opposed to 
giving teachers tenure. So the red bar is actually the bar that's identifying uh, opposition to teacher tenure. And, and that has receded a little bit too from a year ago. So, that's not, so the public is moving a little bit away from reforming personnel policies. And, uh, but still, the support for uh, teacher tenure is much greater among the public than it is among teachers themselves. The one place where teachers and the public agree it has to do with agency fees. Neither the public nor the, teach, the teachers um, are strongly supportive uh, of the idea that if you don't join a union, you should nonetheless pay a fee for the collective bargaining services the union is providing. So, you know, there's a, it's a fairly close sp split with a little bit more opposition than support uh, for this idea, 45 to 35, with a closer, and the teachers, 50-50, it's more of a 50-50 split there among teachers. So, how much time do I have? Well, Marty went on for 10 minutes. You heard him. <laughs> Um, so, I can talk about President Trump here. Uh, what this shows is that um, if, the, if the bar goes to the left, people are persuaded by Trump. No, uh, no are dissuaded by Trump. If the bar goes to the right, they're persuaded by Trump. So we asked a bunch of questions about merit pay, charters, common core, tax credit. I've shown you those questions. But to half of the sample, we will tell them the President, uh, President Trump's position on the issue. He supports merit pay, he supports charters, he's against common core, he supports tax credits. So we will tell them that in the question to half the sample to see whether that half of the sample behaves differently than the half of the sample that wasn't given this information. And, um, Generally speaking, um, you don't get a lot of movement here, and you get it in different directions for Trump. Those are the first four items up there at the top. You know, there's a couple that he moves in his direction, but not by a lot. There's one that, he, that moves away from him uh, by seven percentage points, and there's one that has no effect at all. So, Given the inconsistencies in these results, we end up with our, our interpretation is that Trump is having no overall effect on public opinion on these issues, though you could quarrel with that. Now, you compare that to Obama in 2009 when he was the honeymoon president, and he moves public opinion in the direction that he wants on every issue that we asked about, merit pay, vouchers, and charters. He supported the first and the third and not the second. So, but in every case, he's moving public opinion in the direction he prefers by over 10 percentage points. Now, he's not so successful a year later because he becomes a more controversial political figure in the second year of his term. So there, it's more of a close call as to whether he's able to uh, influence public opinion. He looks a little bit more like Trump now. So if you go to Democrats and Republicans, you will see that Trump does persuade Republicans. So they move in the direction he prefers if they find out his position. And Democrats move in the opposite direction when they learn about his position. So it's a pol his positions are polarizing, but they're polarizing in a more or less balanced way. When he picks up in Republican support, he's losing in Democratic support. Now, this probably doesn't come as a big surprise to you, but it's quite consistent with what we're seeing in our politics today. Moving on to uh, English-only instruction, we asked this question, which is a little different than any question we've asked in the past. Some people say that children who are not proficient in speaking English should initially be placed in English-speaking classrooms. Others say these children should initially be placed in classrooms taught in their primary language, which comes closest to your view. So we really want to find out if the word immigrant triggers something with this question, because in half the sample, we use the word immigrant, and in the other half of the sample, we just refer to children who are not proficient in speaking English. Well, generally speaking, the public does think that people should be immersed in the English language in the classroom. They would prefer that approach to the instruction of people who come from families where English is not spoken in the home. They prefer that to having instruction in the native tongue. So that's true for the general public. 
And it's true for uh, Democrats and it's true for Republicans, although it's especially true uh, for Republicans more so than Democrats, but it's majorities in all case. And it's also true for Hispanics. So we have a, a, a that's the yellow bar up there, Hispanics. So if you just use children, now if you use immigrant children, the interesting thing is these bars do not change. That people do not get, immigrant does not trigger a differential response, except among Hispanics who are a little bit more willing to say, okay, if it's an immigrant child, maybe you should uh, have them instructed in their native language, but it's not a big change. It's 59% to 54%. So basically the story is, is there's not a lot of enthusiasm for bilingual instruction out there on the part of the American public. Okay, so running out of time, uh, I'm just gonna give you one thing to think about. Uh, whether or not people are more tolerant of the formation of school clubs by Muslims, Muslim students, after school than they were in 2008. We asked this question in 2008. We've asked, we asked it again in 2017. We didn't ask it any other year. And the question was, are people more intolerant of Muslims today than they were a decade ago? And what we find is exactly the opposite, that more people are willing to have Muslim students form clubs after school than 10 years ago or nine years ago. And that's especially true for Democrats. Republicans, the balance between support and opposition doesn't change that much. But Democrats become overwhelmingly supportive of Muslim schools, even though they're no more supportive of relig religious students doing this. So for religious students, you know, they're a little more opposed to that. But for Muslim students, they're enthusiastic about it. So whether that, is that just a response to Trump? Who knows? We'll have to check a year later. But you could say that the American public has become more tolerant despite the political rhetoric of our time. Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us. I'm Allison Klein, and I cover federal policy for Education Week. And as Marty mentioned, I'm also the author of the Politics K-12 blog. So I spend a lot of my time writing about K-12 policy initiatives that are being cooked up here in Washington. Um, but inside the Beltway, we don't always have a clear sense of what the public thinks about the big issues in K-12. So enter the Education Next poll. We've all seen the data, and we've heard a lot more about it from Paul Peterson's presentation. Um, and now we'll unpack the implications of it for policymakers with some, the help of some great panelists. Joining us today, we have Marty West, who you've already met. Um, Marty's an associate professor of education at the Harvard Graduate School of Education and a faculty research fellow at the National Bureau of Economic Research. He's also the director of Harvard's Program on Education Policy and Governance. And as most of you know, he is the editor-in-chief of Education Next. Mark Sternberg leads the Walton Family Foundation's initiative, initiatives in education nationally, and he previously served as the senior deputy chancellor at the New York City Department of Education. Um, Mark and Marty and everyone up here have a lot more in their bios. I just, I'm just trying to go quickly. Um, Hannah Skindera, most of you know, recently stepped down as Secretary of Education in New Mexico, and she served in that role for seven years, which is a long tenure these days for a state chief. Um, before that, she worked in the U.S. Department of Education during the George W. Bush administration under Margaret Spellings. Um, and Roberto Rodriguez is now newly the president and CEO of Teach Plus, which is a great organization, um, works to give rise to teacher voice. Um, and he worked on education issues in the White House under President Barack Obama. Thank you all so much for joining us. We really appreciate it, your time. Um, so a number of you have helped to champion charter schools, either in working with policymakers or in your own states. The poll found significant erosion, as we just talked about, in support for charters. So I'm wondering, how closely does that track with what you're actually experiencing on the ground? Did you notice this drop in support in your states or even or at the White House? Um, I, I would say this. Uh, no, we did not notice that drop. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, I um, think back to um, the wait list we have. And I, I do want to make a distinction on charter schools. Uh, we made a big push and effort in, in New Mexico to raise the expectations about what it meant to be a, an effective charter school um, around authorizing, et cetera. We're still in the middle of that push. But far and away, um, the wait lists are incredibly long. I'll speak personally and say I have a little sister in the Big Brother Big Sister program. 
and she was on a wait list of 1,200 kids for a school with 400 students. That is not an exception. That's the rule for our high-performing charter schools. So across the board, when I, when I kind of melt that down, what's the reality? Um, the reality I saw in New Mexico that I still see today is parents want great schools for their kids. And they often, and I think we'll get into this, don't yeah. distinguish charter, non-charter. They distinguish, is it a great school? And will it serve my child well? And that, I don't think, changes over time. I'll just add to that. I, I think uh, Hannah put it quite well, and I agree completely. I think um, it's really clear that parents want opportunity for their children, regardless of the type of school. Uh, I, you know, we, we have seen some, in this poll and in other places, uh, signals around uh, slight decline in public perception around charters. But I think as you really get down to the local level, uh, uh, as Hannah's noted, you see tremendous demand uh, for uh, high-performing and successful charter options uh, for for parents. Uh, I think as parents understand more uh, what their public charter sector can offer them, uh, I think you see a lot more parents uh, attracted to that sector. Uh, you know, we've seen a huge growth in the charter sector, for example, here in the District of Columbia and a collaborative relationship between the traditional sector uh, and the charter sector. I want to underscore that last point because I think it's an important one. I think parents want accountability for their schools and for, their, and for the results for their students. So uh, accountability in any sector, whether it's in the, in the traditional public sector or in the charter sector, I think is really critical. And the opportunities for collaboration so that our traditional uh, sector and our charter sector can work more closely together to share lessons learned uh, and, for instance, to prepare our teachers uh, for success, I think is really critical. Yeah. I'll jump in quickly, but yeah. I'm excited to hear what you have to say. Yeah. I, uh, I think your question was whether the poll results track with what we're experiencing on the ground. Mm -hmm. A Harvard professor is usually not the person who you Very ask true. about yeah. what's <laughs> happening on the ground. But I, I, I'll offer a couple of thoughts. Uh, one is that actually I offer the same survey that we ask of the American public to 100 or so students at the Harvard Graduate School of Education every year. And one of the things that I've seen over the past two to three years is actually a steady erosion of what had been overwhelming support for charter schools. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I've noticed over the years is that these Harvard right. students who are studying education policy presumably track the issue more closely than the typical member of the public tend to be leading indicators of changes uh, that we see nationally. So to some extent, I wasn't too surprised by that. To the extent that I followed this on the ground, it was through the lens of the debate over what was known as question two in my home state of Massachusetts, which was a proposal to lift the cap on charter schools. And that also, then what happened there, the outcome was that that initiative was overwhelmingly defeated, uh, despite the fact that we had long waiting lists for uh, very high performing schools in the Boston area. So, uh, uh, so both, I think, our results are consistent with that election outcome, but also suggest that there can be a disconnect between what parents are seeing and what they're wanting for their child individually, as evidenced by waiting lists for strong schools, and the way in which that debate then plays out in the public discourse. And I think that's where we have seen um, some changes over the past couple of years. Um, there have been some studies of media coverage of charter schools that have noticed a more negative tint to the overall coverage over time. Uh, and I think that's beginning to uh, tarnish the brand a bit. So um, I, think, I, think, I think there's uh, an explanation for what we're seeing. Yeah. Um, well, first of all, let me, let me thank Marty and, and um, Paul Yu for organizing. Allison, thank you for facilitating us. Good to see some familiar faces. Sorry, can you hear me? Good to see some familiar faces, including Dr. Fuller, always an honor to be with you. Jim Blue, my predecessor at Walton, good to see you guys. Um, I, I, I probably will do more synthesis of what you've already heard uh, in the form of an answer here, uh, and, and maybe argue both sides. OK. Uh, <laughs> because I think it's a complicated answer at a complicated moment. Uh, everything you heard from Hannah is true. Uh, you know, the wait lists are longer than they've ever been. Enrollment is higher than it's ever been. If you look at 2016 and 17 policy passage in states uh, and cities, uh, major breakthroughs 
that would suggest radi radically strong support, stronger than ever. Uh, on, the other, on the other hand, uh, nowhere better than in Massachusetts on question two do you see a, a loud debate right now and a fractious debate uh, that, uh, that is not always about or even driven by school quality. Um, so you also see, by the way, not, not just in Massachusetts, you see the pace of authorizing new schools is down and has been steadily declining for some time. There are lots of reasons for that, but I think um, it would be folly not to at least think about the connection between the data Paul presented and, uh, and these trends. And, and I think that's, you know, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll stop here. This is a moment for reflection and learning. There is a lot in play. This data is soft. Uh, no one up here, and I think who is serious in the field, who cares about the quality schools agenda or movement, is ignoring this or should ignore it. And I think, uh, I think we, can, we will probably, I think, Allison, get into what to do mm -hmm. about this. The thing not to do, I think, at this moment is to simply ignore it. So one follow-up actually to that is that one significant piece of the report is that support for char charters has declined among both African-American and Hispanic parents. And that's a population that many charters are really seeking to serve. What do you think are the reasons for that? And what can charter supporters do about it? Well, let me, let me, let me just keep going a little bit. Yeah, there. Uh, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> the, uh, I mean, that's a big question yeah. that I am not equipped to answer, except to you know, maybe share a few thoughts. One, personally, when I speak with <laughs> leaders of the African-American community and the Hispanic community, when I, when, I, when I spend time with parents and educators, I hear from them what you heard from Roberto and Hannah, which is that they want one thing. They want a quality school. And they don't care if it's private or public or charter. They want a quality school. That is what I hear. That is my experience. And I think that is the truth. Uh, I think, uh, so the second part of the, what I would say here, though, is that uh, it is not news to share that the charter quality school uh, movement has, uh, has not always been great at listening to communities. That, ha in fact, has been really good at opening schools. And frankly, if you look at the data, really good at running quality schools. Uh, the, the achievement data is remarkable. Uh, I, I am... Uh, not the first, this won't be the first time I've said this, and I, would, I am not the first to say it, uh, that there's work to do to think about how to connect more deeply to communities, to the institutions that have been in communities long before these schools have, to do a better job of listening, and to think uh, about how to build and foster a stronger connection that is enduring. And we see some of our advocates, I like to talk about Innovate out in California, that they don't start with a school they start with a community. And they get to a school as a solution to a set of problems that have existed in communities for a long time. So that is where the, that is where the conversation and the work, I think, is headed and needs to head and can address part of um, what you're observing in your question. Does anyone else want to weigh in on that? Well, uh, the only observation I would make is that we've also seen, not just at the uh, level of public opinion, but also at the elite level, some erosion of support or actually uh, statements of opposition to the charter school agenda yeah. in the civil rights community. Um, you had the NAACP calling for a moratorium. You had a uh, similar call included in the Black Lives Matter uh, mm -hmm. policy agenda. Um, and so it's it, it, the trend in public opinion is is consistent, consistent with that, not uh, in conflict with it. And you know what was interesting in the context of question two in Massachusetts is the extent to which um, individual families, some of whom were served by charters, you know, that didn't necessarily translate into support for exactly what they were asked to weigh in on as a matter of public policy. So I, I think Mark's exactly right. The, the battles over charter school policy, at least the important ones, take place at the state or, or even the local level. Um, and I think our polling data gives you a sense of what the baseline is as you head into one of those battles. And the question is, how do you then uh, organize to build support uh, among people who, uh, you know, given where they're started? I, just to, you know, I, I'll weigh in and say I think the big takeaway from that finding, Allison, that you mentioned is that 
we have to do better uh, at engaging families and engaging parents in the process around opportunity and change for their children. Uh, we need to give greater agency to parents and to families to define opportunity uh, for their learners. And I think that's necessary and not just contained within the charter movement. I think that is a big takeaway from this poll, right, as we also begin to transition into the conversation around federalism and the role of the federal government in ensuring accountability versus state versus local. We have to remember that our parents and our families and our learners uh, need a strong role in defining what opportunity looks like, what school policies look like, what types of uh, learning opportunities, courses, uh, enrichment opportunities look like for their kids. So, I mean, I think that's a that's an important takeaway from that. I, I also it's also more nuanced, mm -hmm. and you know, I think we also have to recognize that you know not all charter schools are the same school. You know, the charter movement is a very diverse movement. Mm -hmm. uh, our, char our public charter schools look different from community to community and place to place. I do think there are many robust examples where parents and communities are fully engaged in the development uh, of the schools and in the and fulfilling the implementation and potential of those schools where you're seeing really strong examples. Um, if I can just follow up on a couple sure. things. Um, so since I was, uh, reacted first, if you will, to the question, I will say this uh, to kind of uh, compliment and maybe um, add to what my colleagues have said. Yeah. First of all, the first question my little sister's mom asked was, how can we get her into a private school? So to Mark's point, it wasn't about, she didn't know what a charter school was, so it wasn't about charter, public, private, it was about a good school. Um, second, I would say I was recently in a conversation with a really diverse group of um, colleagues and we were discussing some of this polling data, all the things that are going on and, and what emerged for me, and I'll raise it as a question, um, and it, I think it alludes to Mark, everyone's uh, comments around the complexity of what's taking place right now and that we can do better, um, was that there were many other issues that are now on the table, not necessarily related to charter schools. In, an, in a silo. And we have often siloed education, if you will, and said, you know, here's our, here's our bucket, we're gonna do education. Do whatever that means. Um, and, and not taken into account multiple other social uh, justice issues, for example. And in this conversation, literally, it was like, wait a minute, of course I believe in a great education, but there are eight other issues that you're not addressing when you just isolate and talk about education and choice that I care deeply about, and when I add them all up, eight to the very important education, but eight to the, you know, however you want to weight education, I find myself making a different decision that I might have some time ago. And I just want to, and I raise that as kind of, are there other issues that either we ignored, we're not sensitive to, or we're not front and center that are now that need to be addressed. And I, my personal uh, conviction and belief is, yes, there are. That was, that really tees up my next question really well. Um, thanks in part to ESSA, right? Um, states are gonna have a bigger role than ever in shaping K-12 policy. But if you look at this survey um, and the report, it seems like the public's perception um, is shaped quite a bit by these national debates, um, some of which may have only a tangential you know, um, connection to education. So I'm wondering how can state leaders, and Hannah, you're probably a good person to start this out, and parents and others help parents um, and communities see the local impact and rationale for a particular policy. So I'll start by saying, um, so I had, I had the privilege of serving for nearly seven years, which is a long time, and I made a lot of mistakes. And one was, and probably the most significant in my mind, is missing this opportunity early on to recognize that there's an incredible role that all of us that are in ed the education space uh, and responsibility play in making sure that we communicate, not just to our superintendents. When I think of chain of command, I think ch state chief, superintendents, principal, teacher, parent. And that's actually been a traditional systemic kind of uh, mode, if you will. Well, um, it took me way too long to realize that if I relied on that chain of, uh, of uh, and system for communication, for example, to reach parents, I would utterly fail. 
It was the worst game of telephone ever. In fact, we were super lucky if we were still on the same topic by the time we got to parents. So our number one family, again, the people we serve, we were failing out of a, a crappy assumption. And the pain points are incredibly high. And so I would say it is incumbent upon us as we think about impact and education to think about how do we truly reach what I call, and I don't mean to be, be uh, uh, too cold in this, our, our end user, our, our kids and our parents and our teachers in meaningful ways, not our language, because by the way we did, and it took us, like I said, about five years, way too long. We did uh, parent focus groups. Parents who didn't, for example, English was not their first language. They want great things for their kids. When spoken, how they think about it, they wanted many of the things we were trying to get accomplished. When I spoke about it in my nice education, education systemic way, we missed the boat every time. So until we begin to, to talk in, in a, and, and reach directly to our parents and teachers, um, I think we can continue to expect the same kind of results we've been getting on things that polling data will show when asked the, uh, the way that is meaningful to parents, they fundamentally support knowing how their kids are doing. They fundamentally support having choices. They want good schools. They want measurement. But when you put it on a school state report card and it's a whole bunch of you know, um, good intentions, we can miss the boat every time. Is anyone else on a? Yeah, I think, you're, uh, Allison, your question also is, um, alludes to the kind of the pendulum swing that I think we've seen in at the federal level in terms of looking at the most recent um, reauthorization of the Elementary and Secondary Education Act and ESSA, which brings a pretty, a, a more prescriptive uh, approach maybe uh, to, to federal policy making to identifying and fixing some of our lowest performing schools and swings that back to provide greater uh, decision making and authority to our state and local level. And, you know, I, I think it's a reminder that we have to make sure that we are supporting our local communities in ensuring the success of our state and local decision makers in terms of opportunity and equity for, for our students. Uh, you know, I think we um, have a really strong and, uh, and robust federal framework you know, and some and, ro and a robust set of parameters around standards, around accountability. This is not kind of, uh, yeah, and often it gets kind of characterized as this as local locals making all of the decisions about what their schools look like. No, there's still some strong uh, parameters put forth in ESSA, but ultimately, some of this is about a couple things. First, returning the imperative to families and to parents and communities for ensuring accountability and results for their students and recognizing them as full partners alongside the federal government and alongside state policymakers in that effort. Uh, and I think it's about creating greater pathways for our families and for our teachers to participate fully in the policymaking process. And we've not, we, we have to be honest that we've had some great opportunities and some great examples of that. I'm very proud of the work that Teach Plus has done in connecting teachers to that work. But we have not at, on, at scale done that well. Uh, and so we have to really think if, if we're going to have policymaking at the, at the state level and, even, and at the local level with our school boards and our superintendents, what are the mechanisms that truly empower and engage communities and those that are implementing uh, opportunity in the form of better teaching and learning in our cl classrooms? What are the opportunities to connect them uh, for their voice to be heard uh, in that process so that that is not an afterthought? I think Hannah really put it quite well in terms of how we prioritize that. Uh, and so they share in, in building that roadmap for success for learners. Did you want to jump in, Mark? Let me just make two quick points, and you might, you might comment on one or both of these. Um, and I'm just, I'm, I just want to underline some things that have been said. One is the, the, the transition from NCLB to ESSA. And I don't disagree, Roberto, that there are some guardrails. Uh, but this is, a, this is a, and Marty, may, maybe you can comment on any, any line you can draw from that transition to the data 
and the drops in the data. Uh, I suspect there is something there. Um, my second, my second point is just, uh, of course, I agree uh, about the importance of putting parents first. I made a similar mistake when I was a high school principal. My mentor said, the first thing you do when you get to your school is you, you, you start your parent organization and you put them in charge. And I, of course, uh, thought it was a great idea and then promptly ignored it. Uh, but that's what we do in part because it's hard. It is not easy to put parents in a position to influence policy, especially the parents we care most about. And I just say that. It is hard to do the same, although, Roberto, you will prove us wrong with teachers. Uh, and, and, and let's be real about that. It is hard work. It is expensive work. It is laborious and time-consuming work. And it's not like they're walking into a conversation where no one else is there arguing the other side. There's a very well-financed, well uh, well-organized, effective operation arguing the contrary. So uh, it is the right answer uh, getting there, executing on an agenda to put parents in charge of policymaking is, is the hardest thing to do. Um, so just, just keeping it real. Yeah, so um, let me start on responding to that by saying I think I agree with the premise of your question that the public's perception of, of policy is shaped by national debates, even though they are carried out or the most important ones are carried out at the state and local level. And so as I think about that question in light of our polling data, I think the advice I would give to state and local leaders is be very cautious about tying or allowing something you're trying to be uh, trying to accomplish uh, to a sort of strategy being pursued or required uh, from Washington. So uh, that's really what I take away from our findings with respect to Common Core, which started out with overwhelming popularity across party lines, uh, both Common Core in particular and the broader concept of uh, common standards across the states. Uh, then you saw very quickly as it became real and as it came to be associated with the Obama administration, right or wrong, uh, you saw a sharp drop off in support first among Republicans. Uh, but that then created a lot of controversy over the issue that I think contributed to an erosion among Democrats as well. And what was interesting uh, was we saw the exact same thing about five or six years before with respect to No Child Left Behind, which started out with overwhelming bipartisan support then once it came to be closely associated with the George W. Bush administration, you saw a sharp drop off of support among Democrats first, but then later among Republicans. And you saw the same exact dynamic when people remained supportive of the underlying concepts in the law, but the label No Child Left Behind became this tainted brand. And so that's what leads me to say that state policymakers are um, wise when they do things like rename the Common Core standards uh, and take ownership of them as, you know, uh, under their own state. Uh, and they'd probably be better off not to really use that whatever federal attention is being given to the issue as a, um, uh, a leading argument for what they're trying to do in the first place. Can I jump in on that really Absolutely. quick? So yeah. two or three just kind of follow-up thoughts. Completely agree with what um, Marty just said and would say that, um, so uh, many folks have talked about the incredible opportunity that's taking place with ESSA at the state level right now. I couldn't agree more that it's an incredible opportunity. I will also tell you, it is incredibly foolish for anyone to walk around and do community focus groups around ESSA, calling it, a, no, parent, no parent cares about ESSA. They don't even know what it is. And in fact, as soon as you utter a, an acronym, they're like, great, I thought this was gonna be about my, my child. Thanks for wasting my evening at a community forum. Um, it, it, there is an incredible opportunity presented in ESSA for folks that were sitting in seats like mine and still do to engage parents. But the, um, the language and how we do it and what topics and how we talk about it, um, we have for too long been centered on our own selves and our systems instead of the, the as I said, our parents and, and teachers. The other thing I would also say, just uh, Mark is absolutely right. Um, Engaging parents and teachers is the hardest work I've ever done. The most rewarding, but the hardest. It takes a lot of time to build trust, to build the opportunity to actually then come together on something that's meaningful. And the last thing I'd say, and it's probably for another panel, but I can't help myself, um, at the end of the day, 
it is one thing to engage uh, parents and communities and educators, and I fundamentally believe and would love to tell New Mexico's story because it's awesome, but I will also tell you this. Um, without certain, um, pl uh, without plumb line around what it means to be a great student, what it means to be a great school, communications can actually fall kind of flat because there's no ability to determine what makes sense. And I just, I think we often lose that. We go, we, go, we recognize our error in not engaging, and it's a big one, and it's a problem. But we, we can't divorce ourselves from, from the reality that at the same time, there has to be some kind of common, I would say, at the local level, common understanding of, of what, what good is um, in aspiring for goodness together. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to the next question. Speaking of um, initiatives that presidents have embraced, um, we've seen a decline in support for putting in place merit pay, although a plurality, a pl sorry, a plurality um, of the public still does favor it. Um, and fewer people than in the past have support now getting rid of teacher tenure. Um, so I'm wondering, is that a blip? Or is this something, is it kind of the tip of an iceberg? We're going to see more of this. And is there anything out there that you can attribute those changes to? I'll, I'll start and say that uh, I don't think it is a blip in the sense of not being real or mm -hmm. or being uh, an artifact of measurement error, though, of course, you know, uh, two dots does not make a trend. <laughs> right. um, uh, but I think it's consistent with a sort of a gradual erosion of support that includes the drop in support we saw uh, for charter schools in some key elements in of what had been the broader uh, school reform agenda. Um, so we've seen, although uh, no, Paul didn't mention this and, and you didn't mention your question, we've continued to find very strong support for uh, core elements of test-based accountability. Should we mm -hmm. be testing students annually? Should we be reporting the results? Um, but we've seen even some slippage in, in that as well. Um, and so I think there is a um, uh, maybe a frustration or a um, loss of enthusiasm for the uh, conventional school reform agenda mm -hmm. that extends across issues. Um, as to what's responsible for it, I'd, I'd actually be more interested in my, uh, my colleagues' views. Well, I'll, um, I think there are a couple things at play here that are important to note. I do. I think it is. I don't think it's just a blip. To mm -hmm. answer the question, Allison, um, and you know, I think it also met. We also need to unpack kind of how this question is asked, right? And it's not a question of, for instance, if you look at the tenure question, it's mm -hmm. the question was, do you support eliminating tenure or removing tenure versus improving tenure, right? So that's a distinction to be made. The merit pay question. Merit pay is a is a charged term, and I mm -hmm. think they're very different ways that one can implement a performance-based pay uh, and performance-based practice uh, system. So I think the, I, I point out that nuance there because I do think there still is, uh, you know, in terms of my own uh, uh, work and engagement with schools and with communities, I think there is still strong support for accountability uh, in the teaching practice. Uh, I think parents want to and are interested in knowing how their teachers are doing. And in, they're also interested in thinking about how we can, as a country, support our teachers to get better. Uh, so I think those are important um, points to take uh, as we look at the, the findings of the particular survey. The other thing that I think is important to note is that I think there have been a lot of there's been a lot of work done that has shown us that the public trusts their teachers, and we've had a pretty robust debate over the last ten to fifteen years about uh, change in our public education system, and I think sometimes that debate has meandered toward culpability and who's responsible for that change and who's to blame for, uh, imp for where we are today and the fact that we haven't gotten better faster. And whenever we place that blame on the shoulder of teachers, mm -hmm. uh, I think that's 
you know, and, and then walk away from that, I think that that's a big mistake. So um, I think that plays out because I think people trust their teachers and, and when they and when teachers are saying, look, I, I feel like I'm under attack in my system, uh, the public responds to that. So I, I hope we can move toward and, and learn from uh, the findings and from the broader takeaways of this public debate and say, all right, well, what can we do then knowing that our teachers are the single most important resource we can give to our learners for their success? What can we do as a country to invest in supporting them so that we can provide the best teaching and learning for our students that they need to be successful? Yeah, and I, I, I think Roberto gets it right. I also think that um, maybe for the, the close observer, um, which may or may not be the, the polled, you know, the, the respondent mm -hmm. to the poll, uh, I think folks are exhausted. They're just tired of the debate about merit pay and how we evaluate teachers. I mean, we, we, we can't agree on a definition of quality. There is not consensus. And so I think some, someone who's thinking about this question, uh, you know, if, if the respondent is in Park Slope, New York, they're thinking about teachers sending letters home about the uh, now, now uh, failed and uh, rolled back teacher evaluation system in New York that was going to like, be confused uh, in how it evaluated the science teacher or the art teacher for outcomes in the math class um, and, and be something that, frankly, the, the teacher in their child's classroom couldn't support. So I, just, I, I think there is a level of just being ready to look for other solutions. And, and look, there's plenty of data here, charter data aside. What people want is a quality school. They, 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 frankly, what they, it looks like what they want is a quality private school for their child. Um, that's what we see in the data. So I, I, you know, that's a little bit of you know, maybe anecdote from my lived experience at home with my own elementary school kids. But I just think people are, people are a little tired. I don't think Mark's wrong on the tired piece. Um, I think part of the issue that, um, um, and it, maybe it's, it's history, uh, but hopefully it informs the future, and, and that is that we, uh, in most states, we spent a heck of a lot of time talking about how we're going to measure, whether it's at the student, school, or teacher level. Um, and maybe it wasn't so much talking. I, I have these little um, post-traumatic stress syndrome from merit pay and marches <laughs> outside my house and not being able to get to work because the street was closed over a pilot for $7 million out of a $3 billion budget. So... You know, um, and so I wonder why we're tired. Um, but all that to say, I think we got stuck, and there's a debate on rightfully so or wrongfully so. Um, uh, clearly, I have an opinion, but I'll stay. We got stuck on the measurement and never got to what I call the now what or so that. Meaning, we're doing all this for what reason? Not just to measure and walk. Because if you're just going to measure, you know what? If I'm a teacher on the ground, I'm saying thanks. Thanks for measuring me. Number one, I don't think it's accurate, or I don't like it, or whatever it says about me. It judges me. And you did nothing to take me to the next level of, now what? What are you doing to help me be a better teacher? What are you doing to help you know, me in, in my profession? We never got to what I would call the right conversation. I want to I make sure, though, that I emphasize we did it for a reason, and that was we wanted to have a common understanding so we could get to. So I just want to, I, I, I don't disagree. I think folks are really tired. And the sad part is yeah. we're tired, and part of it is we never got to the right conversation for parents or for our teachers um, as we look ahead. Just one quick observation. Sure. I think uh, the question we ask is actually pretty good at getting at the support for the concept of merit pay or performance-based pay as it's been pursued in recent years. Um, but I'm wondering because of these issues, if that's going to be a hard sort of case to make over time, and we're beginning to see hints of that in our data, I wonder if a different framing for the debate over performance-based pay would be, um, to what extent do you support giving principals the flexibility to reward the teachers they believe are most effective uh, with additional pay as a means of, you know, it's like keeping asking, them. It's like asking the Common Core question without using the words Common Core. Yeah, to some degree, yeah. uh, that's right. And, and or should teachers have the opportunity to 
earn more if they're willing to take on additional responsibilities. That's right. a different framing of the concept of performance pay, uh, but it's one that also points, it's not just a different framing, it points in a, a different direction than these yep. highly centralized technocratic evaluation systems that we've been trying to impose at the state or district level towards one where we'd have to trust school leaders a little bit more with uh, making decisions, but give them the flexibility to do it. Yeah, I, I think it's a really good and important point, Marty, that you're making. And, and you know, it relates to what Hannah has said here, which I think is an, ultimately, I think the public is going to want to know beyond pay and performance pay, what about the professional opportunities and, and, and additional roles and responsibilities, mentorship opportunities, opportunities to lead instructional teams in their classroom? The, the public knows that, you know, and I, I think they understand that uh, uh, it, a, a performance pay system and a merit pay system has to be accompanied with something beyond just extra pay for test scores. I think as long as we are in the category of solely talking about merit pay in the form of extra pay and test scores, and that's that's where the conversation ends. I think we'll continue to have trouble as a country with with the issue. I think you'll see the decline mm -hmm. hold. Yeah. Can I? I don't disagree with anything that my colleague said. I, I mean, I feel like I <laughs> I live the pain points yep. of what we're talking about and and mm -hmm. and wholly agree. I I also though. Um, I, I just I care deeply that as we think about what's the next conversation and how we talk about this and how we how we do and how we be in it, um, that we don't uh, miss the opportunity to learn from the past once again. And all I would say is, why did we get to this teacher eval thing that, that many would argue was, was incredibly um, painful without a lot of return? New Mexico has had a different experience. It was painful. But it's had, uh, we're seeing some really incredible things. But New Mexico is one state. And we can't really point to many others right now. And so what's the, but we got there, by the way, just for a quick data review, because when we asked principals, for example, how uh, to actually give an evaluation to their teachers, including student achievement in New Mexico, and it's not an anomaly, 99.8% of our teachers got all the same rating. And we said, we've got to figure out a way to differentiate. In no way am I fighting to go back and rehash teacher evals. I just want to, as we think about, I hope, you know, as this conversation informs, as this data informs, what next? What's policy? What's coming? Um, that we constantly, we don't just do another pendulum swing. We don't just say, you know, uh, well, that didn't work, so we're going to run to the, you know, far other corner of the earth and find, and which is kind of typical when we think about policy at federal or state level. Often we see it's a reactionary policy. We should learn, absolutely. But we should take away the nuggets of why we started in the first place to inform where we want to go next. Okay. So I have plenty more questions, but I want to give um, folks in the audience a chance um, to ask a question. Uh, back to charter schools <clears throat> briefly. There was a lot of talk about how we need to uh, boost support uh, within the community that's getting served. And I think that makes a lot of sense. Uh, but, you know, there, you can make sense of these findings on the left. You know, the Trump effect. We're also missing President Obama, you know, who is a huge supporter of, of charter schools and helped, uh, I would argue, some of the groups on the left stay on board. You know, if uh, not sure the NAACP would do what it did if, you know, Barack Obama, uh, you know, were not at the end of his term or gone. Uh, so you can explain the stuff on the left the the stuff on the right, the fact that we've seen this huge decline in support for charters among Republicans, uh, and not just a one-year blip, uh, this is now a, a pretty long-term trend if you go back a few years, uh, seems really concerning because in most states, it's really Republicans who vote to support charter schools in state uh, legislatures. So I'd just be curious what you think about uh, what might be driving the Republican drop and what we might need to do. Uh, you know, what, Why is it happening and how do we shore up support on the right for charter schools? Uh, I kind of get the sense that some of the stuff you guys were talking about before is all well and good for kind of the lefty crowd, but might be turning off uh, the folks on the right. It's a good question. I'm not sure I have a great answer to it. The decline in support among Republicans is a bit of a puzzle to me, and I agree that it matters because of exactly what you said. That's who has been driving the expansion of charter school policies at the state level, where the debate usually is more partisan than it has been traditionally in, in Washington. Um, I, 
if uh, grasping for insight, I might point to some of the patterns that we see when we ask about different versions of private school choice policies, uh, where we find that support among Republicans is generally higher for more universal programs rather than programs that are targeted at uh, low income students. And uh, I do wonder, you know, the extent to which charter schools have come to be seen as a intervention for low income students in urban areas, not a traditional Republican constituency that either Republicans increasingly see as irrelevant at best. Uh, and, you know, many rural Republican voters, you know, you can't underestimate the, uh, you can't overestimate the extent to which the, they really have strong ties to the to school district as a, you know, source of stability and strength for their community that they, that they uh, sometimes feel challenged or see potentially threatened by choice proposals. So I'll just jump in on the, and I, I'm not bringing data to bear very far on this, so take it for what it's worth. Um, I would say this, uh, over 50% of New Mexico's districts are 5,000 students and under. Um, over 90% of them are 15,000 and under. So the school is the lifeblood of the community. And let me be clear, um, the divide in the Republican Party in New Mexico over charter schools was crisp and easy. And, there were, and it was urban Republicans versus uh, rural. And it was absolutely what you're alluding to, Marty, around this piece of like, wait a minute, this, this is an issue. And, I, and then I'll, this is where I don't have any data, I would say my question that I've been asking for a long time around uh, what folks would call re the re reform community is, um, did we forget the rural and suburban? And did we see even in this election the rural and suburban having a voice uh, that, uh, that, uh, that uh, had some weight uh, more significantly than folks projected, if you will, going back to data? So those are questions I'm asking. I don't have the data to say rural and suburban have ultimately felt forgotten in the education reform community, and uh, their um, uh, uh, they, their voice is growing, and and uh, they would like to be heard. Yeah, let me just speak. Um, no more questions for him. <laughs> uh, the um, you know it is it is of course the right question, and uh, all too often one that we ignore in this conversation. So, Mike, thanks for asking it. Uh, Building on Hannah's point uh, and, and speaking as a grant maker, uh, there's work to do to build a, uh, a, a product that will, that will um, draw a constituency. I mean, just, just straight up. There, are, like, there, is, there, is, as ne there is a terrific need and, and demand for quality schools in suburbs, exurbs, rural communities. And uh, Hannah's right, we, we, have, we have not attended to that. Um, so um, for good reasons that I know Mike would, ag would agree to. But at this moment, in the, in the, in, at, this, at this phase uh, of the movement where, uh, where, where Mike points out a real problem, I think part of the answer has to be think, to think about standing up a set of schools that are going to gonna serve families well and meet demand. And, and, um, and I think, I think an, another less concrete um, thought I have, Mike, is that this conversation is often about the means um, and, and all too often not about the end that we have in mind, which is, um, which is about holding systems accountable for outcomes, which I believe is a, a fundamental pillar of, um, if I can, it, if, if we know what, what the Republican Party is or what it means to be a Republican or think that way, I think it still is central to that line of thinking. So we, we often get stuck in debates that, that, um, that again, are, are about, about ends, not means. And I, I think it's important for us to systematically think about how we can change that, uh, that dynamic. I am probably the least well qualified on our <laughs> panel to alpine on uh, Mike's good question, but uh, I, I will just share it. You know, when I was in the administration, and we we significantly recalibrated the school improvement program and significantly increased resources for that program. One interesting and somewhat surprising finding, as we looked across the country, was that a 
almost over a third of the uh, schools identified under even the previous ESSA frame, pre prior to ESSA framework around SIG, were in our rural and uh, and suburban areas. So, I think for us that just we should think about that. I mean, there we we have to think about what the priorities are for those families and for those parents. And and I think we need to think about speaking to those priorities. And in a lot of those communities, the priorities are not necessarily thinking about charter they think about charter schools as something that happens for other children in other places does anybody besides mike apparently <laughs> um have a question yeah if you at all teased out um in looking at the data uh, because you did say that there was an overpopulation of teachers if you examine that data take extracting that data you know i mean we saw it obviously, as a, a, a whole, a total. But I'm just wondering, in some cases, for instance, in merit pay, to what extent that oversampling may have meant more in the data, you know, in, in the end result, perhaps more so than in some of the other uh, aspects of the study. So I'm not sure I understand fully, but uh, let me be clear that we do oversample teachers, but then when we're looking at the population as a whole, we downweight the observations from the okay. teachers then that answers so that question. they don't make up too much of the that sample. That was my concern. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, but we do see it's important that we do so because uh, very consistently since we've been doing this survey over the past decade, you know, we do see very sharp divides between the teachers and the broader public uh, on a number of issues, often divides that are larger than, for example, what we see between Democrats and Republicans. And so really that is a a dominant cleavage uh, on many issues in the politics of education. Hi, Alice Kane with Teach Plus. Um, thank you. This has been a really great conversation. I, I was really interested in Hannah's last point about, and you know, I was about to, uh, my neck was about to fall off, <laughs> nodding vigorously with your statement that in policy we are so reactionary. And the pendulum swing does go back and forth. And I think we're at a moment right now where we are really at risk of that happening again and missing another opportunity to move the ball forward, you know, farther, faster in the ways, you know, a lot of us have been trying to do for, for decades. And so my question for the panelist is just digging a little deeper on that. Like, what do you see looking back you know, over the past decade or two writ large as the lesson we really need to carry with us moving forward? And how do we take that lesson and integrate that in it, with, with the piece, uh, uh, with the most promise right now? There's a lot of things on the horizon in policy and practice with such huge promise. So just, just digging a little deeper on that, like, how, what, have, what should we learn collectively, and how do we take that as we move forward? And I would also just put a quick plug in. I've been asking this question all summer <laughs> of policy leaders. Um, Allison heard it recently. Um, and at Teach Plus, for our online policy course, uh, we interviewed John King, Arnie Duncan, Andy Smarek, Kevin Huffman. Um, among others, and ask that question. Nobody had the same answer, but there was a huge amount of wisdom. So for any of you non-teachers who want to take a peek at our online policy course, there's some really good insights in there from them as well. Well, let, let me offer two thoughts, and then you all will have better ideas. Uh, and repeating things that have been said already. One is, uh, and this, is, this can sound empty and cliche, but um, I think it's a, it's a existential, uh, and it's it's the idea of really listening to communities, uh, like putting them first, subordinating everything else to think about, uh, e you know, e even like specific policies or certainly a school, uh, to think about the problem statement and a, w a well defined problem statement, and then and then arriving at solutions. Um, and I would say the same is true of teachers. We are at our best in policy development when that is the point of entry. Uh, and very often that is not the point of entry. 
Uh, and I would say, I was able to bias toward the things Walton cares about that everyone up here cares about most. Uh, it's ironic that we struggle with this because whenever that happens in earnest, the outcome is good, like on the on the on our policy scorecard. So that is that is one thought. Again, and, and back to what I said earlier, very hard to do, um, but I would I would elevate that. Uh, and the other the other lesson I have learned, and and some of us have spent some up here have spent some time thinking about this together, is. Uh, we're just not going to get very far if we don't have a bipartisan coalition. And that is a very hard thing to accomplish right now. Because the world is, I mean, it, it, is, a, it, is, a, it is a tough moment right now. It is a fractious moment. And I think whether you're a Republican or Democrat, you agree with that. And so as the parties race to the polls, the separate polls, um, there has to be a safe place in the middle for problem solving. And we're just, we're on this issue, and I would say for the country, we're just not going to get very far if there isn't one. I happen to, you know, I'm inherently optimistic. So I actually think that this community can lead other communities in establishing, reestablishing that center. Um, but uh, that would be my second, uh, second thought. So it's a fascinating question and one where I'm wrestling with what sort of grain size to take when I answer it, what type of lesson to offer. The first thing that came to mind when you asked it for me is just about the role of testing and test-based accountability as a reform strategy, uh, which is that I think it, uh, it that you can't ask, the more you ask of accountability, the more disappointed you're going to be, that it can't be the driver of change. Uh, that's not to say that I oppose testing at all. In fact, I think, uh, you know, fought for the continuation of the annual testing requirement in the Every Student Succeeds Act because I think it's essential. Um, but the more weight you place on that as an indicator for school success and then sort of incentives tied to it, uh, the less useful the very valuable information that you get is from it and the more concerned you are about unintended consequences. And so I think we just have to acknowledge that fact uh, and uh, think about what else we see as the drivers of improved performance and ultimately expanded opportunity for students. Um, and uh, so I think that um, uh, finding the right balance there and the importance of doing so would be the first lesson that I would draw. I think there's also a lot that maybe was implicit in my comments earlier about the extent to which I think the federal government can be the driver of important changes uh, in, in education as well. I think those are, uh, I really like Marty and Mark's points. I think they're really um, good learnings uh, and I, I, I share them too. I think uh, there are a couple things. One is that I think, you know, our, our process of education uh, is uh, at heart a local process. And so I think we need to refocus uh, our energy and our attention to, uh, you know, this is building on what Mark really said here, is on our families and our, and our students and uh, our individual schools and make sure that we are providing opportunities for them to exercise agency over the aspirations that I think we all hold around change and opportunity for learners uh, so we need we need to really wrestle with that I think as a if, if we are going to succeed in the endeavor uh, at the at, at the federal level or even at the state level we need to wrestle with and think about how we create real mechanisms for that uh, I think the other big lesson is uh, that we need to uh, listen to trust and invest in our teachers right and that is uh, you know, just I think front and center, uh, if we have aspirations for change, for opportunity for our students, those have to play out and have to come through the work that we do in supporting uh, improving classroom learning and improving teaching and learning uh, and supporting those that are on the front lines with our learners and those are our teachers. So elevating our teachers, giving them opportunities for voice uh, and for uh, participation in the change process uh, 
as it plays out, I think is truly important. <laughs> So I, I wouldn't uh, disagree with any of, of what y'all have said. I think, and this is, is up here, and then I'll try and um, kind of dive in for a minute. The first thing that came to mind, actually, is um, humility. And I think we're to the point of what, in more specific and much more pointed ways, what my colleagues have said, if any one of us thinks, uh, or entity, or association, or party, or whatever it is that's divided, uh, which maybe all of those, um, thinks we're going to solve it, whatever it is, I think uh, that's part of the problem. Um, I th and I do think um, we're going to have to humble ourselves enough to be able to come to work together and find some of those things that um, we do hold in common, which my personal conviction and belief is it's about 80 to 85 percent of the education space actually comes together well. And uh, we've somehow f uh, are, are giving that, um, that uh, opportunity up right now. And it's incumbent upon us to, there's a responsibility, in my opinion, that we need to take up in that um, as we go forward. A few specific things that come to mind with that uh, spirit, if you will, um, recognize that um, these things take time. And one of the things that works against us in change, or you could say works for us, but is most of the folks who are in positions who are in leadership, whether it's a principal, a superintendent, a state chief, their clock is actually ticking in a, in a um, I think the average state chief lasts two years. Well, let's be clear. Two years is a joke when it comes to trying to actually move the needle for kids in a meaningful way. So, you know, what is the tension of time in and of itself? I, I will not pretend to have an answer. I will just say it's an issue we have to be thoughtful about as we think about solutions going forward. Um, know your role. We can't, no one, you know, system level individual or space can, can really um, solve this all. So how do we, we work together and acknowledge and honor the given roles of leading a classroom and the importance for kids, um, of parents and their agency and the importance, um, all the way to what are the things that you should and couldn't be in the, in the role that you are in. Um, and then I think the last thing I would say is, and this just depends on what um, sphere of influence you're, you're in in education, but know what, um, what uh, I always call it generation you're in. Are you a first generation in bringing some change? Because you'll do change differently than if you're in a third generation and 12 years in. And so how do you, you know, blend those things to inform how to work together better going forward? Know your role, know your time. No, you don't have all the answers and, and recognize what your sphere is and, and uh, what, what level of influence you have. Um, if, you, if you take those into account, I think you hesitate in, in, in the best sense in, in assuming you have all the answers. So we could probably go on for another hour with questions um, from all of you, but unfortunately it's time to wrap up. I want to thank all of our panelists. That was a really great discussion. Learned a lot. <laughs> Thank you.